Well, good morning and welcome to Cross Community Church. We're really glad that you're here. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, uh, I want you to know both here and on our Pecola campus, we miss you. We look forward to the day uh, when we can all gather again. Now, we have been in the midst of a series called The Five Solos. We're kind of going old school about um, 500 years ago. The Protestant Reformation happened uh, when a group of men essentially sought to return us to the faith as handed down to us by the apostles. Whereas in the 1500s and really for hundreds of years prior, the church had elevated um, their own teaching, their own dogmas on par with scripture, such that um, practicing the faith was kind of governed by the church at that point. These men said, um, let's, not, let's not go with tradition. Um, not that there's anything wrong with tradition. Let's not go with kind of these held ideas of councils and popes. But instead, let's look to the scriptures alone to determine um, how, how we should live, um, how we should practice our faith, who God is, and how we should relate to him. So the first of the five solas is that of sola scriptura. It just means that scripture is our supreme source of authority for regulating anything we do with regard to our faith. We look to the scriptures first. Now, in week two, uh, we covered sola gratia. That means that we are saved on the basis of God's grace alone. So what didn't happen is God didn't look down and just like, kind of pick his favorites out and be like, I'm going to give him grace and her grace. She's a pretty good lady. He's a pretty good guy. I'm going to save them on the basis of their merit. That's not what happened. But instead, our God is so good that you and I, when we were dead in sins, objects of God's wrath, deserving of punishment, God looked down from heaven and rather than giving us what we deserved, he instead extended grace upon the world or to the world. He chose to offer forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. So, sola gratia, by grace alone. And then last week we covered sola fide. That means by faith alone. We enter into the grace of God by faith alone. Well, it basically means that the only thing you and I brought to the table was our sin. And so it's not like uh, faith and then a bunch of a lifetime of good works and all that, and then we'll be saved. But instead, the Scripture would say, For we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God so that none of us can boast. Scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone. Now today, we're going to be talking about Christ alone, solus Christus, by Christ alone. Now, you may be thinking um, when you hear Christ alone uh, that maybe in the day of Luther, there were other people suggesting, well, there's lots of other gods and lots of other ways to heaven. Uh, there certainly were, but not that's not exactly what this specific doctrine is going to respond to. Instead, uh, this doctrine emerged as kind of a refutation of the teaching of the Catholic Church. Here's kind of the formulation. If you were a good Catholic in the 1500s, here's what you would have believed and what you would have likely been taught. This was the standing or the position of the church. So there is a holy God. We've talked about this many times, right? Holy God and sinful men. And the way that we are brought back together with God, the way that we can have a relationship with God and know that we're going to be with him in eternity is through Jesus Christ plus the sacraments. So we're separated from God. We're over here sinful. God is holy. Jesus enters in, and, and Jesus plus practicing the sacraments means that we can be reunited with God again. Now, you might wonder what the sacraments are. And for many years, the Catholic Church did too. Um, at one point, their list of sacraments was almost 30 long, um, but they whittled it down to about seven. Now, some of those were very specific to situations in your life, such as if you were going to be ordained a priest, uh, you would be given the sacrament of holy orders. Or if you were to get married, you'd be issued this by the church, kind of the sacrament of marriage. But in every one of these sacraments, the thing that stood between you and God was the church. It was the priest. That if you wanted even the sacrament of penance, if you wanted to come and confess your sins, you had to go to a priest a representative of a church who would then, on your behalf, um, kind of mediate between you and God. It was the church stood between man and God. And so uh, communion or baptism or any of these things, if you wanted to um, relate to God in these ways, you had to do so through the church. Now, for Martin Luther, this was a big problem. 
See, Martin Luther was originally going to be an attorney. He was going to be a lawyer. Um, that's what his dad wanted him to do. But for whatever reason, God calls Martin Luther instead to be a priest. He became a monk. And he was studying in Wittenberg. His confessor, his teacher, um, was a man named Johann von Stoppitz. Stoppitz was a Bible teacher at the University of Wittenberg. And Martin Luther, in wanting, sincerely wanting to follow God, uh, took the sacrament of penance very seriously. Penance meant, meant confessing your sin. And he took it so seriously that there were days where Martin Luther would spend over six hours confessing his sins to Johann von Stoppitz. And when he thought he'd finally confessed them all, he would have to take the time to confess that he might have had pride in his heart about the fact that he might have confessed all of his sins. He so wanted to be united with Christ. He knew what a great sinner he was. He'd read in the scriptures that he was supposed to love the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. But when he looked at his life, he said, my life looks more like I hate God than that I love him. And so Luther took this very seriously, confessing his sins day after day after day, hours on end, trying to be reconciled to God. God, wanting to make sure that he didn't leave a sin unconfessed, that he might still be separated from God. Well, his, his mentor, his teacher, Johann von Stoppitz, actually did him an extraordinary favor that likely saved Luther's life. Johann von Stoppitz resigned his position as a Bible teacher at the University of Wittenberg, and he appointed Martin Luther to take his place. So Luther, if he's going to teach the Bible, he had to begin studying the Word. Now, at one point in Martin Luther's life, it had gotten so bad for him. This is a quote um, from him. He says, he says this, he says, I was myself more than once driven to the very abyss of despair, so that I wished I had never been created. In this formulation that says God is over here perfectly righteous and holy, we are sinful, um, we need Jesus plus the sacraments, Luther found himself falling into despair because he just couldn't seem to do his, his work. He couldn't do good enough at confessing and fulfilling all of the sacraments. And so he began to despair, wishing he'd never been born. Better to never be born than to ultimately face the fires of hell. But he'd been appointed a professor of the Bible, and he began to study the Scriptures, and he began to read about the grace of God. He began to read about the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He said of the book of Galatians, he said, I am wedded to it. As he began to read the Scripture, this doctrine emerged, and it's the doctrine of Christ alone. And what it says is the, the correct formulation is not Jesus plus the sacraments, and that somehow will bridge this gap between God and man. But instead, it is Christ alone that bridges the gap between God and men, that we might have a relationship with him, that we may enter into salvation on the basis of Jesus Christ. So the correct formulation is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. 1 Timothy five or 2, 5 through 6 says it like this. This is going to be our central text for today. 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Again, this doctrine changed everything for Martin Luther. It actually changed everything for you and I. As the Protestant Reformation begins on this basis that says we are saved, we are justified before God, we have a mediator, and that mediator is Christ alone. Luther began encouraging men and women to receive communion. Before that, only priests could do that. He began encouraging men and women to read their Bibles. If you've ever heard of the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer, um, that was one positive by Martin Luther, which says, you don't need to come to me to confess your sins. You can just confess your sins before God. You don't need me to pray on your behalf. Like you, I will do that, by the way. I will pray for you, uh, but you don't need me to pray for you. Like you have a direct line between you and God, and that, that is on the basis of Christ alone and his work on your behalf. So the question that I want to answer for you today is, what does this doctrine mean for us? Because we don't live 
in a society where like politically and socially as well as spiritually, everything is controlled by the church. We don't live in that. What does this doctrine of Christ alone mean for us today? So again, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me. 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to be in verse 5. Paul is writing to the young man, Timothy. Timothy is like Paul's mentee, if you will. Paul had been teaching him and had sent him out to finish up work oftentimes that he'd left undone. And he writes this to Timothy. He says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Now, uh, a few things I just want to pull out of this text for you. Uh, the first thing here is that there is one God. I worked really hard on that point, right? I mean, it's, it's fairly self-explanatory. It's exactly uh, what the Scripture says. But this is important for us uh, because probably we suffer with this more than they did in Luther's day. The people that were arguing with Martin Luther and involved in the Catholic Church, there would have been no dispute about whether God existed and about what God's name was. They all believed in God, the God of the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His name is Yahweh, right? That's the God we serve today. They all believed in God. They disagreed about how you were to, get, how you were to be reconciled to God. But today, if you live here in the United States where we've decided that we have a better grasp on truth than anyone has throughout the history of the world, or maybe where we've decided that truth doesn't even exist, it is important just to remind us that the inspired Word of God tells us that there is one God. I was a sophomore in college uh, in an animal biology class where I learned the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species of more species than you should ever have to know. Uh, I don't know what the point of all that was, except for it was really, really hard. Uh, but as I sat in that class, uh, my professor would articulate things that would often give me pause. Uh, origins of the world, about the nature of God. And so one day I went into his office to have a conversation with him about who God was, and, and I wanted to share the gospel. And I had these visions that he was kind of like, get down on his knees and repent, and he's going to get saved. And I walked out of his office like completely confused by his answer to me. Um, and as I began to share with him about who Jesus was, about the gospel, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe what you believe. I think you're right. But I also think that the Muslims are right. And really what I believe is that God is at the top of a really high mountain and that there are lots of different paths that will take you uh, to the top of the same mountain. And I'm like, well, you're supposed to tell me you either disagree with me or you agree, like the, get on your knees and pray or tell me I'm wrong. I didn't know how to respond to this idea of pluralism. Is that everybody gets to be right, right? This is kind of our everybody gets a trophy society. Everybody gets to be right. Well, can I just tell you that as the church of Jesus Christ, who believes that we are reading the inspired, breathed-out words of God, it is important for us to recognize that though it might feel gentler and kinder and maybe even feel more compassionate to, to let people think that there are multiple gods in multiple ways, but the Scriptures would tell us that there is one God. That ultimately, His name is Yahweh. He exists as Father, Son, and Spirit in the Holy Trinity. And that there isn't some other formulation that's going to work. There is one God. For Martin Luther, he'd read the scriptures. He'd heard like Deuteronomy 6. This was the Jewish Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your might. For Martin Luther, he became convinced that he didn't really love God. Instead, his life looked like he hated him. The second thing I want you to see out of this text is that our sin has separated us from God. Look what it says here in verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Now, you don't need a mediator when everything is good, right? You don't call in a mediator when you agree on everything and, and life is perfect. Uh, I, I know the text doesn't explicitly say it here, but there was an issue between God and us, and that issue was our sin. So as we begin to think about this doctrine of Christ alone, we see that there is one God and that our sin has separated us from that God. 
Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23. The wage of that sin is death. So again, I'm trying to be very clear about the gospel here. God is completely perfect. And we were utterly sinful. There is one God. And you and I are separated from him by our sins. The third thing we see here in this text is that Jesus Christ alone is the mediator between God and men. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. So the the question that arises here is, um, if it's not Jesus plus the sacraments or, or somebody other than Jesus, if Jesus is the one mediator, how did he reconcile us to God? Like, how did he draw us into a relationship with him? There's a couple of words I want to work, with you, or work through with you here. Um, the first is this word mediator. It's the Greek word mesetist. And basically it means one who intervenes between two parties, a perfect God and a perfectly sinful man. Jesus comes as a mediator. He's in between. He intervenes between two parties, either in order to make or restore peace and friendship or to form a compact or for ratifying a covenant. So here is this mediator, Jesus, between God and men. Now, the interesting thing is Jesus is fully God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's John 1, 1, right? But also, Jesus was fully man. He stepped down out of heaven and he took on flesh. That which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which we have touched with our hands. He, like Jesus, took on flesh and he made his dwelling among us. 1 John 1, 1. And it is Jesus, fully God and fully man, that could mediate between a perfectly righteous God and perfectly sinful men and women. He was a mediator. But there's another word here that we need to, to get into. Uh, the scripture here says he gave himself as a ransom. This is the Greek word antilatron. Um, and it, it basically means this. A ransom is what is given in exchange for another as the price of his redemption. If you would have lived in the first century and uh, you got yourself in some debt, I mean, not like low-key, high credit score debt, but like debt where your credit score is dropping and you're in trouble because you can't pay your bills. In the first century, there wouldn't have been bankruptcy for you. Instead, you would have had to sell yourself as a bond slave. So somebody would come and say, all right, I'll pay your debt, but you're going to come work for me. You're going to be my bond slave. And the only way that you could be released from that slavery was for somebody to pay the ransom. Somebody to pay something in exchange for your redemption. Paul says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men. That is the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. The testimony given at the proper time. The wages of sin was death. What we deserved, our just punishment, was the wrath of God. It was death for our sins. And Jesus, as mediator, he intervened between us and God. And he offered himself as a ransom for our sins. Can I tell you that this church didn't do that? The Catholic church didn't do that. Your parents' faith doesn't do that. That grandmother who loved you and prayed for you didn't do that. There has been one man who lived a life worthy of becoming a ransom for us of redeeming our lives. There's been one man, and his name was Jesus, who became, if you remember the Old Testament, um, every year on Yom Kippur, it was a pure spotless lamb that would have to be offered. Only a pure spotless lamb was an acceptable sacrifice. And so Jesus, the Lamb of God, pure and spotless, sinless in every way, he offered himself for us as a ransom for our redemption that we might be set free in him. Again, nothing and no one else 
could do that. There is no other acceptable sacrifice but the pure, spotless Lamb of God. It is Christ alone who is the mediator between God and men. Number four, it is in Christ alone that our souls find rest. The thing that tormented Martin Luther was he thought it was Jesus plus something would lead to salvation. It was Jesus plus something that would save his soul. So he worked really hard. But he fell into despair such that he wished he had never been born. Can I just tell you that the same thing is true for us? The same thing happens for us? If we believe that Jesus plus something is going to ultimately save us, lead to our salvation or our redemption, this something will haunt you. Because you and I, we can never live up to that. You will never be good enough. You will never serve enough or give enough or avoid sin enough. You will never be enough. And that's because there was one sacrifice that was sufficient, and that was Jesus. It is only in Jesus Christ that our souls will find rest. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 25 through 27 say this. Therefore... He is able to save, or he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest. He was holy and innocent and undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heaven, who does not need daily like those high priests. If, you've, uh, if you remember the Old Testament, the high priests, they had to daily offer sacrifices for first for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because Jesus, he did this once for all when he offered himself up. We did the, the sayings of Jesus on the cross uh, a year or so ago, and as Jesus hung there, one of the things he shouted was to tell us, die. It is finished. If you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, trusting that Jesus plus nothing equals everything, the work for you is finished. He is able to save you forever. As I grew up in this church, I, I trusted Christ as a young kid. Uh, but the thing I believed is that really I needed to be good. Now, I would have said that. I would have told you that I, it was like, oh, Jesus plus my good behavior, and then I could be right with God. But I really wanted to be good. And so I worked really hard at it. I, I, I literally, I tried to be good. Now, many of you, if you knew me, you're like, you didn't try that hard, right? I mean, I did. I tried, and I, I failed a lot. I mean, I did. I, I worked hard because I wanted to be good, and I wanted God to be pleased with me, and I wanted to make sure that I was right with him and doing all the things that I was supposed to do. But can I just tell you that it was the most exhausting and futile thing. It is the most lifeless thing I have ever done somehow trying to say Jesus plus Jason Jesus plus this little bit of effort that's what's going to get me but you know what I have found to be so freeing and life-giving it's when I've said it's just Christ alone I don't bring anything to the table here I'm not going to earn anything from God it was his grace alone through faith alone even that faith was a gift the work of Christ alone that ultimately leads to our salvation. You know what happens there? When your soul finds rest in Jesus, your heart is filled with gratitude. You experience the love of God that wasn't on the basis of your works, but it was really just on the basis of His grace. It makes you want to serve Him. It's called worship. It's the natural response when somebody has intervened, become a mediator, paid a ransom for your life that you would want to serve them and honor them. The church of Jesus Christ should never be arrogant or boastful or self-righteous. All we brought to the table was sin. 
But instead, the church of Jesus Christ ought to be the most grateful, the most grace-filled, life-giving people on the planet because our souls have found rest in Christ Jesus. We weren't good enough. We didn't try hard enough. But God has lavished his grace and mercy on us. And so today, I want to ask you that question. Have you found rest for your soul? Have you found rest in Christ alone? Or are you that person who, like me for many years, was Jesus plus a little bit of Jason? That was my formula. That's what I was hoping in. And I was exhausted. And I wanted to give up. Would you bow your heads with me? In these next few moments, I want to invite you to consider what your formula looks like. What's your formula for salvation? We know that there's a perfect and a righteous and a holy God. And if we're honest, we know we've been sinful. What's your formula for having peace with God? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone? Has your soul found rest in Him? Or do you find yourself laboring and striving? You find yourself worrying about your sin, wondering how God feels about you, hoping that you're good enough. Today, the response, the, the invitation to you is to trust in Jesus Christ alone and his work on the cross to save you from your sins and to save you forever. Not for a few minutes until you mess up again, but to save you forever. Jesus only went to the cross once. He died for every one of your sins, past and present and future. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and there you will find rest for your souls. Is your soul at rest today? And if not, would you trust in Jesus? Can I pray for you? Father, we bow before you right now. And God, I, I just am inclined to worship you in this moment. Father, to praise you for your goodness, to praise you for the love that is far beyond love that's shown in this world. God, it's a love that finds us sinners and chooses to intervene. It's a love that offers yourself as a ransom when we were the ones who were guilty. We were the ones who owed the debt. It's a love that provides rest for our souls. Not because we work hard enough or perform well enough, but because of your profound grace that you poured out on us. Father, I pray for every man and woman and young person in this room today that today would be the day that they find rest for their souls. That today would be the day that they come to faith in you or they come to trust in you fully. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.